I'm Marshall. This is Ben. We're going to talk to you about four years of datomic powered ETL with closure and candle. Uh, as I said, that's us. We were both trained in the sciences. So originally, Ben did his PhD in earth science. I did my PhD in genetics and genomics. And sort of by happenstance, we both ended up in the software industry. Um, the work that we're going to talk about today on the Candle data platform that we did at the Parker Institute was sort of a first return to the, the sciences for both of us. Uh, and it was really an opportunity for us to bring back what we learned in the world of software uh, back to our experience as science, trained scientists. So I mentioned PICE. Uh, this is where we did this work. The Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy is Sean Parker's philanthropic organization whose mission is to accelerate the development of breakthrough immune therapies and strives to turn all cancers into curable diseases. So how did this project start? Um, you know, hundreds of scientific papers are generated every month. They're all available in the public domain. They all have lots of data associated with them. What if there was a way to connect the dots across all of those and look in a single system that could see the emergence of patterns in that data, perform advanced analytics, and keep scientists up to date with that critical, accurate information. These folks, these lovely folks on the screen, uh, Federico on the left and Lacey on the right, were uh, data scientists at the Parker Institute in 2018. And they sort of asked that question and couldn't find a system that did that. And so they said, well, maybe we should build one. And they actually came to Cognitech, where Ben and I were both employed, uh, because they had some experience with Datomic and felt that the technology really fit the problem space in a unique and interesting way. And that became the project that we're going to talk about. And so there are several aspects of this project that I think make it unique and particularly interesting maybe for this audience. Um, both Ben and I spent time on the Datomic product team. Uh, as well as consulting for Cognitect as closure developers prior to the start of this Candle project. Um, throughout our careers, uh, both before and after that, we've ended up on both sides of the table. So we've both been biological or, or earth scientists, data scientists, consuming this data and sort of suffering the realities of what biological software is out in the world. As I said, we were both at Cognitect, solving, helping solve people's problems with these, these tools. And then later, we both actually ended up as employees at the Parker Institute, both as developers and users of that platform and product owners of the development of that platform. Of course, I say we. We were a very small part of a very big group of extraordinarily talented people that we had the opportunity to work with. I don't have a pointer. The two lovely people up in the top left corner you might recognize uh, helped a whole lot with the ideation of this project and the design of some of the meta model work that Ben's going to talk about. I already mentioned Federico and Lacey. You see me and Ben at the bottom. This is Kurt Christensen, who was our project lead du jour, uh, uh, extraordinaire, excuse me, on this project for quite a long time. Uh, in the middle, this was a, a group of individuals who came on a little bit later. So Robin is actually here. He's in the top left. He was the engineering lead for all of PICE for a very long time, uh, and actually is still there. And without his leadership and sort of shepherding, this project never would have gotten where it went. Mike Travers in the middle uh, on the top is uh, an old school Lisp uh, hacker who, who has some extraordinary capability around the human machine interface and, and did a tremendous amount of the work that I'm going to talk about. Rob on the left on the bottom uh, built the Mantis tool that we're going to talk about. Uh, both of them were software developers at PICE. And then George, who's also here in the back, was uh, at the time was at Cognitect and came on to help consult on the project for quite some time. Uh, on the right, there's Let's see. Chris, Nick, Danny, Tim, Annie, Kwame, Mike, Jessica, Shannon, Anastasia, Chris, and Wesley are all phenomenal bioinformaticians <laughs> who at various points rotated through the PICE team and did a lot of the research that I'm actually going to talk about later in the talk. But moreover, they were phenomenal users and feedback providers for the software engineering side of the work we did to actually make this tool as effective as it was. So, you know, I said a lot of stuff about this. How, how did this story actually happen? As I mentioned, uh, Federico and Lacey came to Cognitech to start this project. I believe that was fall of 2018. So just down the road, actually, in the Cognitech offices, we did our I0 with Kurt and Federico and Lacey. 
Uh, by 2019, the first iteration of this system was up and in use at Pisces. Uh, spring of that year, we started integrations with R, which we'll talk about shortly. And uh, summer of that year, the first version of a tool called Mantis came out. Uh, additional ecosystem tools were developed later in that year, in the spring, raw sugar, and flame. And then fall 2020, Ben came to Pisces as a full-time employee. I came to Pisces as a full-time employee in summer of 2021. And by summer of last year, we had more than 50 data sets available for use by the bioinformaticians at the Parker Institute. Uh, in this system. And then a month ago or so, uh, a lot of the system that we're going to be talking about was made available in open source. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what motivated um, us to build Candle the way we built it. The main goal here is, you know, I think pretty straightforward. So we wanted both to increase the pace and the quality of research that was being done at PICE. And to do that, we looked at what the biggest headache was. And anybody who's done data science work knows that there's a very small amount of like modeling and interesting science and a ton of taking data in one shape and turning it into another shape. Uh, so, and this is also where you know, a whole lot of different errors come in to the system. Um, it's a very big problem in biology. I think for people doing biological research, the amount of like diversity of data types you have and the amount of processing that has to be done on them to produce meaningful features that you can do science with, and the way small decisions kind of propagate through in terms of quality and um, you know, reliability, uh, it, it's one of these you know, hot spots like that. And it's also one that you know, has kind of been sort of slow to innovate with a lot of the you know, cutting edge of um, data systems, cloud systems, et cetera. Um, the big thing here is that all of these issues propagate throughout and they impact the quality of the science. Um, people spend all their time hunting down the issues, hypothesizing about what the wrong things are. Um, I think this is an important thing to emphasize that the hammock time is lost. People get ideas kind of stuck in their head that then end up being a result of an artifact of the way the data was processed. and it, it's hard to get that wrong initial impression unstuck, even if the person is trying to be as you know <coughs> proactively um, you know skeptical of their own thinking and scientific. It, these things just get in and are sticky sometimes. So, keeping all of that stuff out uh, is an important goal here. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with like biotech or uh, pharma world, there's a sort of sad joke that. The you know, E-Rooms law is how you describe the drug discovery process for research and development investment. Um, basically, what that means is the cost of finding a new therapeutic over time increases, has increased exponentially. The, um, by contrast with this sort of you know, ballooning costs of drug development, uh, the cost of getting biological data has gone down really significantly. So, you know, the, the mission accomplished point where most of the genome was sequenced uh, was in 2003. If you look at the cost of, that was spent to get to that point, roughly about $3 billion, uh, now you can have the equivalent sequencing done for $600. It's a very commodified process. Um, the data availability, the production of uh, you know, data and information from biological assays, it's gone well past the exponential growth point. It's sort of super exponential process, so greater than Moore's law. Uh, but what has come out of that is no change in the progress for the exponentially increasing um, drug discovery. So is that because data has exacerbated the problem in some way? Has data had no impact on the problem? Is data part of the problem or not? You know, it's, it's hard to say if, you know, I, I mean, the big thing to me is that data should have an impact on that. If you look at all these other domains where people have gotten like machine learning scale data sets um, or even been able to use sort of classical statistical techniques, um, logical techniques and so on, search, this stuff has not been unlocked uh, in biology and in a way that has impacted therapies that end up being able to go to patients and treat them. Um, so, you know, the hope is that we can do better. Um, that means integrating a lot of these different types of data sources, 
bulk molecular data, patient outcomes, clinical assays, imaging, single cell data, features that are derived from other assays or from raw data, like raw sequencing data that on its own is hard to interpret. Um, PICE was also kind of at a unique vantage point here. There are lots of partners across industry, across academia. There are new and experimental assays that were coming online that there weren't kind of established templates for how do you handle the data from this. And there was a very small team there that was split across different projects and trials. So, you know, the informatics team was at various points supporting, I think we had like three or four ongoing trials as well as like something like eight or nine big academic partner sites at some of these bottlenecks and it was not a, a large team at all. So it was sort of, you know, we were pretty constrained there. Uh, the other aspect of it is that the data is deeply relational, derivations from other data sets are deeply nested, and the kind of data that you get, especially with regards to patients, like demographics, outcomes, it's in different forms. It might be broadly censored. It might, you know, you might know what somebody's overall survival under a certain treatment was in months, or you might just know the outcome as like a discrete variable. Um, there are lots of different things there that the data model had to accommodate. Uh, in kind of a classic table sense, this is a, a reference schema from OMOP, which is just for the clinical part of the data. Um, it, and you can see the number of edges fanning in and out across a lot of these things. Uh, basically, you have what are, in a sense, reified edges where you have different, you know, everything that you know about a person is, is with respect to a time point at which they were observed in a particular setting when certain conditions were present. And those things have to be linked across uh, multiple domains. Uh, in, this, in this model, there are 37 tables and 394 fields. And again, that's just the clinical side. On the omics side at PIC, you know, omics data is kind of this catch-all term for genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, all the different new data that's been coming online over the past two decades in biology. And this can be at multiple types of uh, provenance with respect to the patient. It can be a certain measurement can apply just to the patient or a particular sample. It can apply to a tissue. It can apply to a section of a tissue that was imaged and that it's been derived from. You can have cell populations or single cells that might be physically separated in a lab or analytically derived. And all of these things target different biological entities where you have kind of well-known descriptors of vocabularies like genes, proteins, uh, mutations, and so on. And those things themselves have non-trivial relationships. So, you know, and we, you know, this is something we had to accommodate in the data model over time. Even our understanding of which proteins and genes are related is not necessarily stable as we learn more. The, the way that genes are subdivided on chromosomes has evolved over time. These things all impacted what we were doing with the schema and the data modeling. Um, so I don't, you know, for the, the technical side we're going to get into, I'm going to try to highlight some things that aren't maybe well represented in the other talks. But we do have two other talks on Candle. They are from earlier days in 2019. Um, the, the first one, Closure Where It Counts, Tidying Data Science Workflows, that is um, when we released the Data Log R uh, library, which was the first thing we open sourced, which uh, gave R a path to talking to um, Datomic by generating queries. There's also the Building a Unified Cancer Immunotherapy Data Library that was at Strange Loop in 2019. Um, that one goes into some of the details of how the system works and more of the rationale for why it was built from Pisces perspective. The, uh, the first entry, the first thing we built that you know, enabled all of this was a tool called PRET. Um, again, open source like all the other things we're going to be discussing today. Uh, PRET is an automated ETL that's at the heart of Candle. It's how we get data into Candle. The important thing about PRET is that everything in PRET is driven from data that it retrieves by, you know, querying the database, you know, inspecting the state of the schema. There's an additional layer of annotations with the schema, which we call the meta model, that help drive this process. 
And then at, at the other end, you know, we have specs that ensure both granular data accuracy and cross data set referential integrity uh, through a validation step. Now, the, the kind of simplest version of PRET or thing to describe here um, is, you know, you can think of these mappings that take a table and say which columns in the table are supposed to match which fields in the database. And those then get turned into entity maps and datums, which get transacted into the database. Um, that by itself is, you know, several people have probably built something like that in some system you've worked with. The, you know, we have a sort of larger syntax in there that supports, I, I think what the core part is that's interesting in Pret is re, having a system for relating uh, the identities that you see that occur in different files to each other so that you resolve all these identi identities to the correct entity so you build this highly relational um, graph-like model that you've derived from the data in its entirety, not having to resolve all that later, but at the time that you compile uh, the tables coming in into entity maps. Um, have a walkthrough of that. Uh, Again, this, this is sort of kind of showing some of these entities as we get you know, a little more um, realistic or complex into where things go. We can have cell populations. A cell population is an example of one of the entities that could be uh, recursively nested. So if you have uh, you know, T cells, you can derive from that populations of helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells, for instance. So you can have cell populations that are members of other cell populations. The, um, this is a subset of the schema to kind of show how uh, different things are related in it. The sort of core abstraction that would go along with each import is we were importing things one data set at a time. And those data sets would correspond to published papers and like the supplemental materials that go with those papers or particular clinical trials we were running. There's some unifying purpose for why that data is there or unifying place from which that data was collected. It, in that data, we have different types of assays. The assay can you know, run in different ways, so there are potentially multiple measurement sets that an assay produces. Um, and then those measurements that occur inside of the measurement set are logically you know, linking across different entities. And within the measurement set, you might have entities created either in the physical analysis or the, um, you know, or just in the data science process, like for instance, cell segments, uh, these things are all targets of measurements. So when you add a, add a measurement to the system, um, that measurement has to refer to uh, a particular protein, and it does that through an indirect edge, which is an epitope, which would be an instance of a protein, um, or an instance of that protein that has a well-known identifier. Um, that's that measurement was taken for a particular cell population, which was derived from a particular sample. And then that linkage from the sample to the subject that's in the graph is how you relate what you're seeing happening in the cells to how did the patient respond to the treatment they were given for a cancer immunotherapy. Um, the bottom example just does the same thing um, with transcriptomics, where you have a, a gene product. Um, that we also had cases where we had to disambiguate, for instance, immune cell populations like T cells, B cells. These entities, um, if you saw just the text B cells, you know, this is kind of a simplified version, but if you saw a particular text in a particular context, how you resolve that identity would depend on how these things are defined and scoped within the config graph. Um, or the, I should say the tree here because there's a, a root. So within that tree, so you know, you basically would recursively walk up the tree to identify and match uh, identity. Uh, again, this is you know, this is a sort of small version of one of these config maps that gets created. But these are the an example of the types of things that have to resolve to the same entity so that the, the atomic model gets created correctly. Again, what's driving this process is just this extra annotation later. So. Um, we have different ways that we concatenate IDs and determine and resolve identities. We have um, a child-parent relationship and different kinds of things in the schema. And this additional annotation layer is all that uh, PRET needs to be able to take 
arbitrary tables and turn them into a highly connected uh, relational model in Datomic. Uh, this, is, this is just a, a more recent version of the data model uh, hanging from data set in the schema. So you can see, you know, with clinical observation sets and observations, adverse events that are observed, particular diseases that those refer to, et cetera. Um, there are lots of things that you have to come up with a way to connect to one another um, in non-trivial ways. So the first uh, tooling for access that came about here, uh, we have various R tools that were created. Pisces um, data science team used Candle primarily from R. We also have a data model that supported query over plain JSON. Um, and a service layer for that. Uh, we deploy that at different points as datomic ions, as a sort of um, simple beanstalk deployment behind load balancer, you know, different ways to deal with different scales of data. And then this powered the other things uh, downstream. So I'm going to turn it over to Marshall. So thanks, Ben. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the actual experience report of using these tools. Um, as Ben started to mention, the core candle database represented by the candle sort of icon here pretty quickly became surrounded by a number of additional libraries and tools that enabled both upstream uh, you know, accumulation of data feature definition and import as well as downstream uh, tools for analyzing and consuming that data in a variety of methods. Um, so the first of those I'm going to talk about sort of logically in the path of a, a data set that might run through the system was something we called raw sugar. This was a brainchild of Mike Travers, who I, I showed earlier. Raw sugar is a, a web application for structured handling of the raw data files, right? So these assays that have been mentioned, you get the data from a vendor, and it's usually a bunch of binary files if they're images, or a bunch of text files if it's sequencing, and you know, gigabytes of these things, or maybe even terabytes. And Usually those things are not particularly semantically interesting as files, but they obviously contain a lot of important feature information to be extracted. But in the sort of being good stewards of the scientific data, it's important to know when you get to that feature extraction and later use of that data, where did that come from, right? Where was the raw file? What was done to the raw file? How did it match up to the samples that were gathered in my clinical setting? Uh, that's what Rush Sugar does. So Rush Sugar itself is also built on Datomic. It includes an immutable history of all the file updates and changes and lets you relate data as received from the vendor. So you, know, you get a dump of data files that have you know, uh, sample IDs or something. And then you can upload your list of actual patient IDs that match to the sample IDs and maybe what time points they were taken or the assay or the dates. And it can do fuzzy file matching and does pretty sophisticated metadata management to let you keep track of, hey, these are the files I got from this vendor on this date. They correspond to these these aspects of my clinical system. You can build dashboards and visualizations to actually manage uh, the collections of those data. So for in this example, you can see there are a bunch of time points, and each of them might have a few different file types. And you can see, oh, we don't have all of them for this time point. Maybe we should go track down that vendor. Uh, and then ultimately, all of this connects to the next set of tools that are for feature generation and, and putting that data into Candle. And so all of this metadata, as appropriate, is essentially piped right out into the system that then builds the transactional data for the data store. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning Mantis. So Rob uh, was the primary developer of this tool. One of, one of the really exciting uh, bits of work that we got to do at Pisces was some analysis of, multi, of high dimensional, multi-dimensional imaging. So this is, this is microscopy where you're looking at signal across 40, 30 or 40 different signals in a given slide, right? So it's 30 or 40 different proteins where they're located on that tumor section. Uh, and those are all represented by different colors here. Um, so this is an analysis and visualization tool for that multi-channel microscopy. Uh, it was written to be very user-friendly and, and useful for both scientists and clinicians to look at this data. But more importantly, it also has the capability to aggregate features to the level of an individual cell or a population of cells. Those features then are some of the things that Ben already talked about being modeled in our candle uh, ecosystem. And this is a video. Let's see if this is going to work. Excellent. I think it's running. Well, maybe not. Nope. Uh, 
There's a video, you can watch it online. Um, oh, there it goes. Uh, so, so the tool also lets you do things like, in this particular example, pick two markers, right? It, deploys, it displays the intensity of those markers on scatterplot. And then you can say, I only want the things that are high for this marker and not for this other marker. You can select that population of cells. It'll highlight them in the image. It will also generate uh, a list of those cell identities and the intensities if you want. And it can output all of that information, again, in a format that's compatible with the downstream consumption of that. So this is a place where some of that feature identification can be done essentially by that process of selecting subpopulations of cells based on scientific you know, interest. Um, the, the, both of those, as I mentioned, are sort of upstream of the Candle data platform, or the Candle database. Uh, obviously, once data's in there, we want to be able to do things with it. Inflame is another of uh, Mike Travers's brainchild, and this is a visual query builder and interface that uses this block canvas. So this is like the Blockly kind of like scratch um, tool to help users, scientists, essentially build queries against the Candle data model in data log. And a couple things I want to point out, and I'll go into a couple examples here. Um, so you can see the blocks fit together. You know, samples can have subjects, and subjects can have diseases. And the sort of shape and color of these things is limiting as far as what's actually allowed by the data model. But none of this is hard coded, right? All of these block relationships. So again, you can see in the schema at the bottom, subjects have disease, or sorry, subjects have diseases, and they come from samples. All of that is derived uh, dynamically by introspecting that meta model that Ben mentioned. Uh, I'm going to step back a second. Additionally, you can run the queries in this tool. But the other thing that it does is it actually generates the queries themselves in both R and data log. So you can imagine, you can build these queries, you can then take the actual data log code and use it on you know, sort of another system if you wanted to. Again, all of this is dynamic, so there's nothing about the candle schema as it sits right now that's special. If you wrote a schema about a car dealership, this tool should be able to help you build visual queries about that if you have the right meta model built into your system. Uh, so what is it actually like to use this system in the context of, of biological discovery? Uh, I'm going to give a little sort of history lesson for those of you who haven't worked in biological data science. Um, not using this kind of system, the way you do this work, you get sequencing data or you get Cytoff data, you take the raw data, you run some number of arbitrary third-party tools and libraries, and then you probably have a bunch of ad hoc scripts. Likely there's a step in here that involves Excel. Um, you probably have files, hopefully they're in the cloud, but I guarantee you they're not. Um, you know, Graph had prison to make some of your figures. This is like, you know, like you guys are kind of cringing, this is like pretty bad, right? But okay, I mean, I guess it's like a linear path, it's fine, but this is actually what you do. Um, this is, you know, you pile enough of these data types and the specific workarounds and the coordination and you get something that looks like this. And so like anybody who looks at this is like, well, obviously, like you need a data warehouse and we're all engineers, so you know how to make a data warehouse, right? We put a little spark and docker on it. I'm like, this is way better. Um, add to that the fact that um, Excel, this is not an old paper, right? This is 2021. Um, I, you know, Excel loves to change four letter all caps acronyms into dates. So there's a gene called septin. And, and until last year, when they changed it for this exact reason, the, the, uh, the official abbreviation for septin was SEPT. And there are septins one through seven. So septin two is SEPT-2. And Excel turns that into nine slash two slash 2023 every time it's in a spreadsheet. This is everywhere. Right, so like, this was the experience of doing bioinformatics that led to the idea that we need a unified set of processes, workflows, validations, uh, all the way from data ingestion through analysis. So the idea here is you still get that raw data, but I already showed you raw sugar, right? We now already have a single unified place for the things to go. It's not 17 S3 buckets that everybody has their own naming scheme to use. That tool pushes data into a data structure that we have a set of libraries called Worker B that know how to consume that data, generate the features, and that PRET config that Ben showed you, that then puts it into Candle, and then we know we're happy because we have good validations there, and we have all that downstream consumer uh, capability. 
And having this kind of a system in place supports growing the set of assays, right? So no longer is it just sequencing a site off. We can add, maybe we can add clinical observations, all the other things been talked about. And on the other end, you know, we can use lots of different primary analyses as long as we just have to build those connectors from raw sugar. And ultimately, we can support analysis across in many different types of, of use, not just the R packages that I showed, but you know, interactive dashboards and even things like Python has been mentioned. So what did we actually do with it? Right, that was how we used it. This is a list of a bunch of the research projects, both uh, sort of completed and ongoing. Most of these links uh, link to either the paper or the poster. These were all powered directly by data that's, that was put through this process and put into Candle. Um, feel free to check these out. I'm gonna focus on the PRINCE trial um, in this talk. So the PRINCE study was a phase two trial of chemo plus one or two immune uh, oncology uh, drugs. And what made this trial particularly unique is that it included what we call multiomic profiling. So we did a bunch of different assays on these patients as they traveled through this trial, right? It wasn't just, oh, give me one blood sample and I'll do some sequencing. It was immunophenotyping, it was flow cytometry, proteomics, yes, sequencing, and multiplex imaging. And we put all of that data together into Candle. And if you remember that multidimensional picture Ben showed of all the things relating, we did that work right here in the middle. We capture those multiomics, multiple time points, multiple locations, and the result of this trial was that this high dimensional approach let us identify new biomarkers that correspond with particular responses, positive or negative, for those patients who received that particular intervention. So that's not a far cry from actually being able to take those biomarkers and move them into the clinic where you say, hey, you come in with pancreatic cancer, we can test this in your blood, we think this is a better drug option for you than that other one based on this data, right? So this is using multiomics to really push clinical medicine to a place where personalized medicine is, is a real possibility. Uh, I'll leave you with one slide about the kind of data and how much of it we ended up with in Candle. This is a log scale on the left. Uh, you know, number of different types of assays on the bottom. So we have tens of thousands of patients worth of data of varying different types that was in this system and accessible to the PICE informatics team for this kind of analysis. So I'm gonna talk about things that went well and things that didn't. I, in this case, you know, most of the things that didn't were things we were able to get ahead of and solve. Um, the biggest takeaway I have for any of this is because we did everything data-driven off introspection from the schema, <laughs> we were able to very quickly fix whatever we got wrong in the data model and regenerate all the tooling downstream without having to go and rewrite code over and over and over again. Um, so it, you know, things that were planned, like oh, we have to, you know, we have to add a new assay. That was the kind of thing that went in after a day, and the implementation work was like 15 minutes of editing a schema file. We had cases for, um, you know, cases where constraints that somebody naively thought would apply to the biology did not. Uh, an example would be like a protein like was modeled so that a protein was encoded by exactly one gene. Well, it turns out there are proteins you detect in assays that are encoded by multiple homologous genes and you can't necessarily determine from the form that you have which gene produced it. So changing that constraint, one line of code, everything was fine. Um, you know, there, there were multiple things that we changed about, like just names, ways that things were nested in relations, adding indirection, like, you know, a basically a reified edge in a case where we thought something would be directly related, but we had to put attributes on the relation and open that up for many. All of those things, you know, that evolved, we were able to stay on top of and pretty minimally support. You know, again, I, I was working, by, when I was working at Pisces full time, I think supporting and developing stuff directly in the primary PRET part or the Candle Datomic database was less than 20% of my time there. And that, you know, there was maybe shared five or 10% of somebody else's time. There was not much time spent on this particular thing, which made me happy because I had time to play with images. Um, the, you know, the data harmonization work was just, it was greatly cleaned up. I think the biggest, pain points for users using the system was trying to figure out what the spec errors they saw meant. 
We could have done more development work to clean some of that stuff up, but it was also kind of a good problem to have. One, we were catching things that would have just made it into the final analysis otherwise. Um, and two, a lot of those things we wanted to have conversations about how to clean up instead of like, oh, there were multiple conflicts, so I took the mean and put that in. That kind of thing happens a lot in data science cleanup, so it made all of that stuff visible. So I kind of stubbornly left the spec errors alone uh, for a while so that we would have to have those conversations. Um, things we had to fix, you know, one thing, I think the thing we sat with the longest was trying to figure out how to handle the fact that somebody adds new data to a particular data set and, or this data set was transacted into the old version of the schema and we just evolved the schema, so what do we do? We had different implementations and machinery we'd put around, okay, so we've got our one datomic database that has all the canonical data sets in it. Um, let's retract the data set and do it again. Maybe we need to have some kind of like diff merge workflow where we calculate the difference and we do the updates and we track that as a batch set. You know, Marshall, me, George, I think is in the audience, several of us worked on several different solutions in this space. Um, I think the obvious thing in the end was just use multiple datomic databases because we didn't have the con transactional constraint we were only ever putting batch imports in. So we could you know, put these in their either own individual database or you could have them you know, sort of multi-tenancy in this database if you wanted. But then we just had a publishing system on top of that. So you would publish a canonical version of the database or attract it. We put a datomic in the datomic to manage all the other datomic databases. And this very quickly resolved the problem and you know, made it so that we had an easy way to show people everything that was in there, which things were blessed and which were not. You could turn on the I know what I'm doing button that would show you every single thing that was in there and not ready to look at, or you could just keep it to only publish data sets that people had marked as the canonical version of this data set. Um, and that you know, greatly simplified the experience. Let's see, we're at time, but we had a late start. I think we could probably could do a couple more minutes. Uh, the second thing I'm gonna have to be quick about, but I'm happy to talk more about later, is that we started getting larger and larger data sets. The initial like transcriptomics bulk measurements we got were already kind of on the edge of what datomic query is best for. When we got single cell data sets or image derived features, it quickly moved beyond that. You would have result sets that were like, you know, you might have 50 million results come out. Um, in the end, we just created a measurement matrix entity to encapsulate this. So basically the numeric field field in this sense like an array or tensor, your large two, three, n-dimensional object that has all the numbers, goes into S3, you would store in that data structure. In this case, we, because people were preparing from R, we just had simple TSV files. If I would do it again, it would probably be Parquet or Czar or something like that. Uh, but those data sets would go there, and then you would just store all of the relations that were in there. So this, uh, the prep matrix indexed by here, uh, sample IDs, uh, you know, barcodes, Hugos, et cetera, those would go into Datomic as a set of all the things that that measurement matrix had numeric values about, and then the R client would join all that back together. And this was kind of appropriate because you would have to do dimensionality reduction or clustering or some kind of other pre-processing to really understand what was going on. So you're not usually doing numeric range queries, that kind of thing. That quickly and yeah, if, again, if I if I if I'd do it again, um, I probably would have gone off the happy R experience of TSV to do sort of more sophisticated tensor data structures. Um, so with respect to what we are open sourcing, so all of this, everything we talked about, it's all open source. In Flame, um, you know, the Visual Query Builder, um, Raw Sugar, Candle, Mantis, everything is there. Um, these data harmonization problems aren't unique to biology. The for 95% of the tooling that's up there, with the exception of some of the downstream R analysis libraries, all you need to do is come up with a meta model for your schema and you can use that tooling and experiment with it. Um, we think other fields of science or even kind of generic data science uh, you know, could benefit from it. And you know, even if you're looking at putting things in some like massive query engine like, um, you know, like some of the different AWS platforms or things that are like in MapReduce land, I still think going through that datomic layer and checking all the constraints there is extremely valuable and you can define, like with the uh, Presto Trino integration, 
deterministic ways to get out of that. Um, so, yeah, so the last step is just where Marshall and I are now. Uh, we're no longer at um, PICE, PICE's clinical trial division um, sort of wound down. The informatics is not operating at the scale it was operating at and mostly is in kind of, you know, ensuring the longevity of some of the projects that started there, more in that mode rather than taking on anything new. Uh, Marshall and I are both at different organizations that are working at collecting data at scale, still with the same mission, making a difference in cancer patients' lives. Uh, I'm at a machine learning imaging focused startup. He's at a nonprofit, uh, which is sort of a building a data commons for rare cancers. Right. Final link here, if people want to go to the GitHub to find some of these tools, QR code. Thanks. Thank you.